If you will, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. So good to see so many, because there have been so many that have been sick. And to listen to, besides the singing, of course, and everything, uh, Kind of sounds like the last time I went to the dog pound. Everybody was barking. But we're glad for you. those that are barking. We're glad that you're here. And hope and pray that your condition will improve. And for those that are sick and unable to be with us, we pray that their reasonable portion of health will be given back to them. We've been studying concerning... Jesus is what's often referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. We have looked at it from Matthew's account as we find it recorded in the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters of that book. We have seen that the subject, the primary consideration of what Jesus is teaching in this sermon pertains to the kingdom of God. We saw that as the context as before the sermon began in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, that Jesus went throughout all Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And we know it was a, the matter of the kingdom that Jesus was teaching about because all throughout the sermon, from chapter 5 almost to the end of chapter 7, he refers to the kingdom. In fact, he uses that word some nine times in seven verses throughout that book, those, throughout those three chapters. We've, each and every lesson, we have given an outline, and so far we have seen that we can sort of subdivide the sermon into three parts, all of them pertaining to the kingdom, but in chapter 5, verses 2 through 16, he talks about the citizens of the kingdom. In Verse 17 of chapter 5, all the way through chapter 6, into the 12th verse of chapter 7, Jesus talked about the righteousness that will be characteristic of the kingdom. And then what we hope to in our study this morning is to look at what we find in chapter 7, beginning with verse 13, concerning the encouragement that Jesus gives to enter into that kingdom. And so these are the things that we have looked at thus far. We have looked at five different lessons over the past several weeks concerning the Sermon on the Mount. And what I want us to do in our study this morning is to look at chapter 7, beginning with verse 13. And we'll read through verse 27, but we'll also be able to conclude the sermon with verses 28 and 29. So we'll briefly... I'd like for us to give a little bit of a review, since this will be the last lesson on the Sermon on the Mount that we'll be doing. We talked about in chapter 5, in those first 16 verses, Jesus clearly identifies who and what will be the citizens of this kingdom. We've seen the characteristics, as we saw in what we commonly refer to as the Beatitudes in verses 3 through 12. And then Jesus talks about how that the citizens of this kingdom ought to have a certain impact, a certain influence upon the world that they live in. They will be living in a spiritual kingdom, but at the same time, they will be having to live in a physical, a national kingdom, as you and I are today. We live in the United States of America. So we have our earthly kingdoms that we have to live in, but as citizens of the kingdom of God, there are characteristics that we need to possess that will certainly bear influence in a positive way upon the citizens of this world. In looking at chapter 5, verses 17 through 48, we saw what Jesus said concerning the righteousness of the kingdom. He, sees, he says that it, it, it's a righteousness that harmonizes with the Old Testament. And yet at the same time, it is a righteousness that will exceed and that we too are to exceed. 
the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. So we looked at that lesson. It was in chapter 6, in the first 18 verses, that we see that Jesus talks about the fact that this kingdom is a kingdom that demands and requires sincere devotion. Sincere devotion in the sense that we do what we do, not to be seen of men, not to receive the praises and the glory of men. And so he uses three things that were common to illustrate this, where it comes to the giving of alms to the needy, whether it was prayer or whether it was fasting. All of these things were not to be done for the purpose of being and appearing righteous before men. So if that was the case, then Jesus explained in each one that would be the reward that they could only expect. In our study last week, no, not last week, but week before last, we talked about concerning chapter 6, verses 19 through 34, how that we need to trust God in this kingdom. And what that means is that we are not to lay up for ourselves treasure here on this earth. For the simple fact of the matter, that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. And also for the fact that if we truly trust in God, we will not worry about the things of this life. Where do we have the physical blessing? Because God certainly has saw to it that his creation is taken care of. And Jesus says, are we not better than they? And it was last week that we looked at the part of chapter 7 in the first 12 verses concerning the relationship of the citizens in this kingdom to the devotion. Well, let's see, I went backwards, I'm sorry. In our relationship to our fellow man. And we saw in that lesson that we're not to judge hypocritically, not that we're not to judge at all, as many people try to take Matthew 7 and verse 1 to teach, but we're to judge righteous judgment. We're to judge not with the fact that we see a speck in our brother's eye and we have a moat or a beam in our own eye, sorry, but we need to judge righteous judgment. Remove the things in our lives so that when we do judge others, that we will not be engaged in the very thing that Jesus is condemning here in this verse or these verses, and that is judging hypocritically. We saw that in order in our relationship to one another, we need to be gracious. Gracious to others just as God is and has been gracious to us. And we've studied concerning that rule that we've often referred to as the golden rule. We need to treat others the way that we want to be treated. So when I study this morning, let us look at how that Jesus in verses 13 through 37 urges us, now that he has laid out the things, the description of the kingdom as he has, in this sermon, now the encouragement to enter, the plea that he makes to enter into this kingdom. And also in doing so, after that we see all of this, it ought to be our desire to want to be in and to remain in this kingdom. So in these verses 13 through 27, we see that in verses 13 and 14, Jesus talks about entering the narrow gate that leads to life. In verses 15 through 20, he talks about how that we're not to let false teachers turn us aside and away or out of this kingdom. And in verses 21 through 27, he shows that truly only the obedient are those that will enter the kingdom. So have your Bibles open, as I hope you do, in chapter 7. Let's read verses 13 and 14. Anybody navigate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few <coughs> who find it. So Jesus says, to enter this kingdom, 
has to be entered in the narrow gate. But what Jesus is teaching and seeing that we can see in these two verses is that there are two gates that Jesus makes mention of. And a gate is always the beginning, the entrance of what we will then go and follow in whatever the direction that we are led after we enter into this gate. He says that the wide gate allows for many things. The wide gate allows many through and all of their baggage, all of their sin. That's the wide gate. But then this straight, as the King James calls it, or this small gate admits one at a time, kind of like a turnstile if you've ever been to an airport or some other place of where there is a lot of maybe some uh, auditorium or somewhere, there is this turnstile that will allow people to go through only one at a time. And not just anyone then can enter this kingdom, Jesus is saying. And recalling what we read and studied concerning the Beatitudes back in chapter 5, starting there at verse 3 and going through verse 12, the Beatitudes show us the kind of person that we're to be in order to be in this kingdom. So that truly establishes the fact that entrance into this kingdom can only be through this narrow gate. And all of this is really a definite contrast to this common idea that we hear throughout the religious world today that really all a person has to do to enter the kingdom of heaven is to just believe. But what Jesus is saying in these two verses surely stands far different from what the religious world in general has in their concept of what to do to enter into this kingdom of God. But in addition to the two gates Jesus talks about in these verses, he also talks about two ways. And that is, after we have entered the gate, there is a way that we will travel. And Jesus describes those two ways. He says the broad way gives room to really just do whatever. Do whatever we please. That's the broad way. But then this narrow way, which we can certainly define it as being a more confined, a more restricted way, that of necessity makes it difficult. That is a way that is by far more difficult, more hard to travel than the broad way. So when you realize that Jesus is making it clear that the road ahead, if we're going to get in through the straight gate and walk the narrow way, that that road is a demanding road. It's a demanding way. And you know, it may be at times very restricting, very demanding, meaning that we will be required to sacrifice, sacrifice our own wants, and to do the very thing that is the most difficult for us, all of us, to do, and that is to deny self. Not only that, Jesus talks about the fact that there are two kinds of travelers. He says there are those that are the many, and there are those that will be only the few. He says the many is really those that make up the majority. In fact, most of the world is not in the kingdom. Most of the world is lost. They're lost now, they'll be lost in eternity. And so really these two verses of Matthew 7 are very humbling verses, <coughs> excuse me, but at the same time, they're verses that need to make us, in our humbleness, to be submissive, to be willing to understand that we're not going to be in the majority, most of the people around us 
are not going to be the influence for us that they need to be. Most of the influence around us is going to be contrary to the things that we need to be doing. The influence around us is going to cause us to have motives that we don't need to have. So we need to be aware that even though we want to be among the few, that it's going to be a struggle. That's one of the things that makes this a narrow way and a straight gate. So many of the world is not in the kingdom. And only the few, Jesus says, the few will be the ones that will enter the kingdom. And by entering the kingdom, we know that that means that they will be saved. And this is obvious when you think about it from the kind of people that we've seen back in chapter 5 and the Beatitudes that Jesus uses to describe who are the citizens of this kingdom. And we looked at those. So always going back to those Beatitudes, the descriptions of the people that are to make up this kingdom, then we need to see why, as Jesus has said here, in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, while there will be many that will enter the wide gate and travel the broad way, while there will only be a few that will enter the straight, the difficult gate, and walk that difficult and restrained way. But Jesus also talks about something else in these two verses, two destinations. He speaks about life. Those that will walk the narrow way will enter, will, it leads to life. What is that? Well, it means nothing else but heaven. Life is heaven, oftentimes depicted in the scriptures. While at the same time, Jesus says those that walk the broad way, that leads to destruction. And that has reference to nothing else but to hell. So these are the two destinations that Jesus is talking about concerning these travelers and whether they enter the straight gate or the narrow gate or the wide gate and follow that broad road or they follow the narrow road. The destinations are heaven and hell. Then two, we see the encouragement that Jesus gives to enter, enter the straight gate. Not the gate that he talks about that is wide, because notice what he says. It's because of the benefits. It's because of the rewards. Look at these two verses again. <coughs> Excuse me. The wide gate and the broad way is the way that leads to destruction. See, that's the reward, that's the benefit of the gate, the wide gate and the broad way. Then look, he says in verse 14, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. So truly, the benefits are plainly given to us by Christ. And you know, when you think about these two gates, these two ways, doesn't it really fit into the fact that overall the tendency, the likelihood of a typical person is to do what? It's to do what's convenient. It's to do what's the easiest the least difficult, the least. And so it is then that this is the encouragement that Jesus says in verse 13, by the narrow gate, because of the benefits and the results, the rewards that it will provide. All right, now let's, Go back to chapter 7 and pick up with our reading at verse 15. Beware of false prophets. 
who come to you in cheap clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree that bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So we see then that Jesus says concerning this kingdom, we're encouraged to enter it. We see the gate that we must enter, the road that we must travel. We're not given any false hopes or false assurances. We're just given the bare truth in the matter. And now he says, there's something else to consider. Don't let false prophets cause you to turn aside. Why? Well, Jesus gives the reason. They appear harmless. Notice he says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. So we see in all of this that false teachers are nearly always disguised. They're not going to appear. They're not going to announce themselves in the true of what they really are. They're going to be disguised, and that's one of the things that makes it difficult to recognize them. That's why there's even the more need to be wary. Because we see that false teachers are the cause of why shallow-minded people have this way of thinking that, well, how could such a nice person be wrong? Because what they're looking at is the personality, the appearance, the physical appearance. All of these things have their impressions upon all of us and make the impressions upon all of us. But Jesus says that's not the way in which we need to be considering these folks. They're going to appear pious, humble. They're going to appear to be wonderful people, great personalities, likable, friendly. But it can also be a part of this ravenous wolf that they really are inside while all of the while they appear to be a sheep. So they appear harmless and they will destroy our souls. That's why Jesus says, be well. It's what they can do. What they could do to you. What they can do to me. They can destroy that which is the most valuable thing that we have and we ever will have here on this earth. A soul. And so we must understand that if they are false prophets, they're teaching anything and everything but what the truth is. That may be mixed with a lot of truth. And that's again another one of the disguises that false teachers used to mix truth, a lot of truth sometimes and just mix in just that little bit of error. And yet, it's always and will always be truth that will save. Error will not save us. Truth saves us. Remember Romans 1 and verse 16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power for salvation, only true saved. And Jesus made that point very clearly in John chapter 8 and verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And this verse is not to be taken to apply to economic and social and, and political freedoms. This is to be applied to the greatest freedom that a person can ever have, and that is freedom from sin. And it's only the truth that can make us free from sin. 
So it's truth that saves. It is error that damns. In 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning with verse 10, that with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they do not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. So there must be a love for the truth. There must be a willingness to believe the truth. Or otherwise, false teachers, that is, we said a moment ago, the very things that false teachers prey upon. They prey upon those shallow-minded people that can't see beyond the disguise, beyond the person, beyond the things that are being said. Because Jesus Christ, in these verses that we read, from verses 15 through 20, makes this statement. We will know them by the fruits. He stated it there in verse 16, and he repeated it again in verse 20. You shall know them by the fruits. What are the fruits? Well, one thing that the fruit includes, obviously, is their teaching. In 1 John chapter 4, <clears throat> in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we see, no, try the spirits. Don't believe every one of them. Regardless of their personality, regardless of their charm, regardless of all of these other things, regardless of how much truth that they may teach, examine them to the understanding that you test. Put it to the test. For the very simple reason that the majority of what we will hear, what's it going to be? The majority of what we hear is going to be false because that's what makes up the majority in this world. Many false teachers. But then look at that verse 6. John says, We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now let's make the application of this verse 6. John is saying, We are of God. John is saying that we who are the apostles, we who are inspired of God, we who have been given that promise by Christ that he would leave the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to bring all things to our remembrance, and that the Holy Spirit would also speak and guide us into all truth. We're speaking by inspiration. It is God breathed the things that we speak and the things that we write. So John says, we are of God. And then he says, he who knows God hears us. And we need to make that same application today when it comes to this New Testament right here. Whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, whoever we find is the writer of the New Testament. They are of God, and we need to hear them. We need to make sure that what we read in this New Testament, that we're reading the very things that are spoken unto these men by God. And if we refuse to hear what the apostles say, John says, we're refusing to hear what God says. Because of the simple matter, he who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. So here, whether or not we believe in the things that are written and revealed in the New Testament, is the very test 
that John talked about there in verse 1. Because he says, by this, whether or not we're willing to hear what these apostles say, by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So this is the test as to whether or not this person, this individual, whoever they may be, is speaking the truth or whether they are a wolf in sheep's clothing, teaching those things that will cause our souls to be lost. Not only do we we know by their teaching, turn over with me to Second Peter. Second Peter gives us a good description here of false teachers. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I almost read the whole chapter, but turn with me and let's look at the verses. Verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 2. There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, by whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Look down to verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Verse 12, for these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, Speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practice and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Now look down to verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those that live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So we see, truly, another way by which we can judge their fruits is by the lives that they live. And really the lives of those that they have taught, those that have been willing to listen to them. In 1 Corinthians 15, notice what we have here in verse 32. Paul said, if in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So it is then that we see the fruits by the what is taught by the lives they live, and we can see it in the lives of those that are willing to be their followers, to be listeners to them. And you know, this fruit, it will eventually be seen when all of these disguises are removed. They'll be really seen for what they are, for what they really are. But let's turn our attention back to verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7. Because here we see that Jesus makes another statement concerning the kingdom. In Matthew 7, beginning our reading at verse 21. And my 
page just stick it together. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You see, it will not be the religious who are disobedient. That will enter this kingdom. Because what we read in these verses is they call on him as Lord. And they make claims of him being the Lord. And what we've always said about that word Lord is ruler. They make claims that he is ruling in their lives. But they don't obey. And that's what Jesus said. He also made the statement that Luke records in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Why do you call me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So if I'm your Lord, if I'm your ruler, why don't you do what I say? I mean, how can it be any simpler to understand? If indeed we want Jesus to be Lord, we call him to be Lord, we're claiming that he is the ruler of our life, where is our lives in harmony with what he says? That's the test. That's the determining factor that helps us to see. But you know, there's some that teach a lie. And that's what we saw back earlier in verses 15 through verse 20, these false teachers. They teach a lie, and as we've seen in verse 21, they live. A lie. They, Jesus says, work lawlessness. The King James uses the word iniquity. And I think we're probably more able to associate lawlessness. You take the word law and take the word less, and it means without law, without authority, without authorization. That is lawlessness. So then, it will be the ones who obey, Jesus says, that will be saved. And what he does here is he gives us an illustration of two builders. Don't let this be verses that we've heard ever since we were knee high and to the point that these verses mean very little to us anymore. These verses need to mean more to us now than they were when we were new high. Because Jesus is teaching a very important lesson to illustrate how important that it is that we are obedient. And how obedience is so important when it concerns the kingdom that he's been preaching about ever since chapter 5 and verse 1. So in his illustration, Jesus says, the foolish man, he built his house on the sand. And what Jesus says concerning someone that builds a house on the sand is, here is a person that hears. You can't say that he refuses to hear or he has never heard. He hears. But he does not obey. That is the person that is building, Jesus said, his house on the sand. And we know what happens on a weak foundation. It won't stand. It won't stand trials and troubles 
what is physical or things pertaining to this life, whether weather-wise is what the illustration is talking about, or whether Jesus is teaching the things that are going to transpire in our lives, that are not always going to be easy to overcome. These are going to be the things that are going to wear away a foundation of sand if we're only the person that's willing to hear but not obey. It might be that this person that hears but doesn't obey He's weak. You know, we have a lot of things spoken of in the New Testament concerning brethren that are weak. We talk about faith, and we talk about how there are different degrees of faith. There are those who Jesus rebuked that says, Oh, ye of little faith. So there's always a tendency for those to be weak in faith, and that could be the reason why they hear, but they don't obey. Or it could be that, that they're wavering. Maybe there's things that are occurring in their lives. Maybe family problems, job problems, health problems. But these are the things that affect. And it may be causing us to waver, or maybe, maybe they're just the outright rebellious type. They're not going to do regardless of who says it, regardless of what's said. So you've got a long range, a wide range of people here, from those that are weak to those that are wavering to those that are outright rebellious. But even in all of those categories, these are people that can still hear, but they're not going to obey. And that makes no difference who or how he builds, because sand is sand. You cannot make a foundation out of sand. And that's the point that Jesus is making. There's always those that want to build, but they want to build quick. They want to build easy. That doesn't work in the kingdom. And that's another thing that Jesus is teaching in this illustration. You don't build quick and you don't build easy. You don't cut corners. There's no shortcuts. There's no broad way. Jesus has explained all of that. But he says, the wise man that built on the rock did so because he heard. Just like the man that we looked at to start with. He heard. Both of these people heard. But this man that built his house on the rock, he obeyed. And we see all of the difference in the world that that made. So, here's what we've seen and what Jesus said here in verses 13 through 27 of Matthew 7. The plea, everything that we need to know concerning entering into this kingdom. Now, <clears throat> let's look at verses 28 and 29. The sermon is finished. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Let's look at the reaction that was given to this son, because that's what we've read here in these two verses. The reaction was, what a wonderful son. And I've said ever since I began this series of lessons, this is the greatest sermon that was ever preached. And these people recognized it too. He said that the people were astonished at his teaching. But not only was it a wonderful sermon, but they were even greater impressed. Back up one. They were even greater impressed with his teaching, his teaching. Why? Because he taught as one that had authority and not as a scribe. So yes, it was the greatest sermon that was ever preached, 
And it was also the greatest preacher that ever lived. So this was the reaction. They were greater impressed with the preacher. And so being the wonderful sermon that it is, and being from the wonderful preacher, the greatest preacher that ever lived, the question for them and for you and I today and for every generation since the New Testament has been recorded, the question is, why not enter the kingdom? That's what this sermon that Jesus gave was all about. From beginning to the end. So today, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you've not had your sins forgiven, you've not even begun to develop those Beatitudes. Maybe you're here and you're like one of those builders that we just finished looking at in chapter 7. You're hearing, you've heard and you've heard and you've heard over and over again. But you've not obeyed. Where are you building? How are you building? On what are you building? Be honest. If you hear and you don't obey, you're building your house on sand. And you hear it as a Christian and at one time heard the gospel enough to believe and obey the first principle, but yet you're still not willing to let the gospel lead you in the things that you believe and obey. If you're st not obedient as a Christian in what Jesus said, you are building your house on the sand. And if something already hasn't, something surely will come along in this life and your house will fall. You see the lessons that Jesus is teaching? This is not an elementary illustration given for five and six-year-olds. This is an illustration given for five and six-year-olds all the way up to 50, 60, 70, and 80-year-olds. If we hear and we don't obey, our house is being built on the sand. Only when we hear and obey is our house being built on the rock that will stand, regardless of the things in this life, regardless of what happens to our jobs, regardless of what happens to our families, regardless of what happens to our health. We will remain firm, sound, Faithful. Because I trust all we've looked at all through this sermon. We don't do things to be seen of men. We don't lay up for ourselves treasure here on earth. Our hearts are in heaven. So today if you're here and you need to enter the kingdom, now is the time, not tomorrow. If you're here and as a Christian you hear that there are things in your life that you're not obedient, you've sinned. You, you are just like those that we read about earlier in chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Lord, Lord, well, what are we doing the things the Lord says? If not, we are practicing lawlessness. So as a Christian that has sinned, Sin needs to be forgiven. We need to put our devotion back to God. All of these things Jesus has dealt with in this sermon. So today, if we can assist you in either of these ends, now is the time, now is the opportunity. While together we stand